White Sox baseball, it's game three of a four-game series against the Oakland Athletics right here on the south side of Chicago, WGN Sports on my 50. Filling in for the Hawk, this is Chuck Swirsky, along with Cy and the award winner in Steve Stone. Steve, two years ago, tonight's starting pitcher for the White Sox showed a great deal of promise. Last season, he struggled, so what have we seen in 2015? We've seen some very good stuff from Eric Johnson. And a couple of years ago, he looked like he was ready to go in the major leagues. You can see three and two, his ERA three and a quarter. Last year when he got his opportunity, I'm not sure exactly what went wrong. He's not sure what went wrong, but a lot did. His ERA was 646. This year, International League Pitcher of the Year at AAA, 11 and 8 with a 2.37 ERA. He's pitched in two ball games here in the major leagues, a total of 11 innings, and he's thrown very well. He's given up four solo home runs. Those are the only runs he's given up, and so this is a guy that has to show that he's ready for next year prime time. So far, he is doing it. Everybody very happy with Eric Johnson, and hopefully he goes on and throws a good ball game tonight. Yes, love to see it. Now, with the season winding down, Steve Stone, Sox fans have a chance maybe to watch some history in the making. Anytime you get a chance to see something you've only seen one other time in the history of this game, it's special. And that's where it starts with Jose Abreu. Because he's chasing after a number that's only been achieved one time, and that's 30 home runs, 100-plus runs batted in. He's 28 and 91 as we speak. This was the 91st last night. The only other man to ever have 30 plus home runs and 100 plus RBIs in his first two seasons, that was Albert Pujols with St. Louis back in 2001 2002. And hopefully Jose can get there. He's swinging the bat very well. He's getting his hottest at a time where the Sox could really use it. Certainly he could use it, and he's been a pleasure to watch. Yeah, speaking of pleasure, it's going to be a great night at the ballpark for fans as well. It is indeed, because tonight it's Bark at the Park, so enjoy it. All right, so it's the White Sox and the Athletics. WGN Sports on My 50. First pitch coming up next.
for tonight's game between the A's and the White Sox. And with the bullpen stretched to the max over the last couple of games, the Sox made a roster move today, recalling Scott Carroll from AAA Charlotte. Earlier today, Robin Ventura explained why Carroll is the right man for this situation. You know, we were in a situation last night, um, you know, bullpen-wise, you get a, a, a day where you get a guy go three and you get a 14 inning game and another guy go three, you get a little light. So, um, you know, Scotty's here and, and uh, as an innings eater to be able to come in there and uh, if you need somebody. I, I mean, we don't enjoy having Lurie and, and Alexi trying to uh, do any more than that. So I would rather not use those guys. Stay tuned. We'll be back with the lineup of the first pitch right after these messages. for the most live sports. Welcome back to U.S. Cellular Field on a beautiful night. Let's look out. Bob Melvin is going to line up his Oakland A's. It's Fultz, Simeon, and Reddick at the top with Kenna, Butler, and Lowry in the middle. And Sogard, Smolinski, and Blair rounded out. The defense and how they'll line up behind Eric Johnson, left to right, Melky Cabrera. J.B. Shuck in center field tonight with Abasil Garcia in right. That's Mike Old, Tyler Saladino, Carlos Sanchez and Jose Abreu in the infield with Rob Brantley behind the plate and Eric Johnson on the hill. He's 1 0. This is third start is ERA 327. He's given up four home runs. Those are the only runs he's given up. And as long as you don't walk anybody ahead of home runs, they're solo home runs, you usually wind up in pretty good shape. The umpires for the game tonight Stu Sherwater is behind the plate, then it's DJ Rayburn at first, Joe West at second, and Rob Drake is at third. So Bob Melvin looking ahead to next year as is Robin Ventura on the other side of the equation and that's what both teams have left at this point and so they've thrown the ball around the infield which means we're ready to play baseball and sitting in for my partner Ken Harrelson who's got some family business to attend to. I want to turn it over to my play by play partner Chuck Swirsky. See you just can't get rid of me can you huh. You keep coming back. That's right. Always a pleasure and good evening folks. It's a beautiful night for baseball and we are underway here. Well, the White Sox and the Athletics, Sam Fold in his second stint in an Oakland uniform throughout his career at the plate against Johnson. Fold, a German top ball player, Stephen, you have seen him in different uniforms over the years, but a brilliant defensive ball player. I think really he's best suited as a fourth outfielder. I think he's a pretty good one. And there's a ground ball right through the middle for the base hit, and we are underway here with a man on now for Oakland to lead off a board. And really, it's not demeaning to say he's a fourth outfielder. It just means that you got a lot of versatility. He can play all three outfield positions and give you a good left handed bat. But as far as starting every day at this point of his career, I'm thinking on a good team, he's better suited for the swing man version. As long as you have a big league uniform on, that's a good thing. Yep. Marcus Sibian at the plate. Sibian two for 10 in the series, 12 homers, 38 RBIs, batting 253. And see, you've been around Sibian. 
throughout his career, obviously, starting with the White Sox and whatnot. I've never met him personally, but everyone says what a class act. He's a terrific guy. He's a very nice guy, and he's a good athlete. The problem has been defensively a shortstop. He's committed 34 errors. And a lazy fly ball to right. This should be an easy play for Garcia. He makes the catch. But anytime they bring in a coach specifically to work with you, and that's why Ron Washington is sitting at third base. He was a wonderful major league manager, did a great job with Texas. They brought him in specifically to work with Marcus Simeon because he understands the infield. He's a great infield instructor, and they believe that he's going to help Marcus because they think Marcus can hit in the major leagues. He's shown that. They're hoping he can field in the major leagues. He has yet to show that. Probably only a matter of time, I believe, that Ron Washington's going to be back in the dugout as a manager. And all of a sudden, now Hermie is going out. They want to talk with Eric Johnson, and this is never a real good sight. No. He's going to bring on the not only the manager of the White Sox and Robin Ventura, but also a meeting at the mound with the ball players and also the umpires, including country Joe West. Who began his career back in 1976 in the National League and Herb Schneider talking with Eric Johnson. We'll take a look at the last pitch. I can't detect anything there, Steve. Well, at that point, he appears to be okay, and I think when Robin and Hermie went out there, he kind of said that he was fine. Obviously, when you get your opportunity to start again, the last thing you want to do is leave a ball game early. But that being said, you also want to make sure that you're 100% healthy so you don't endanger anything. So hopefully, everything works out all right. Especially the top of season Johnson had in Charlotte, as Steve mentioned in the opening tease, the International League Player of the Year, Pitcher of the Year. He had 22 starts in Charlotte. He's going to bring on Josh Reddick, covered and drove in four runs last night. I don't remember last night, Steve. <laughs> we're, try <laughs> we're trying to forget last night. This has been a bizarre series, to say the least, in the first two games. It has that. Been a lot of baseball. Let's see. In the uh, first game on Monday night, a combined 15 pitchers, a total of 495 pitches thrown in that ball game. We like to refer to that as the 509 game. Five hours and nine minutes. <laughs> yes. And then last night, about seven men pitched for the White Sox, including Garcia and Ramirez, position players. Reddick at the plate. 0 2 count with a man on and one out. Reddick, 18 homers, 73 RBIs, batting 280. Reddick has always been a good, solid player. Mm -hmm. He's had some injuries during the course of his career, and that's really sidelined him for a bit and set him back. But he swings the bat well, plays a good, solid outfield, and he's got a good, strong, accurate arm. You know, Reddick actually replaced Adam LaRoche in Boston in July of 2009 when LaRoche was traded. So the dots connect. This is fourth year with Oakland. Having a fine season. Trying to match his career high of 84 RBIs. A ball in two strikes with one out. One thing Eric has done, and I think this has been a good thing, is he's speeding everything up as far as getting the ball and throwing it. And that's what characterizes first two starts. He got the ball. He didn't take a whole lot of time and he got rid of it. And you have to appreciate pitchers who work at a rhythm Steve. If you can get that rhythm then it's up to the catcher to keep you in the rhythm and so far that's what Johnson has done in two particular starts and Brantley caught him down in the minor league so he's very familiar with him. That's one of the reasons why he's behind the plate tonight. As you look at one of the four legged version of Bark at the Park they all come with a human being who's got a couple of legs. We 
again one and two with an out here in the top of the first with Oakland and the White Sox afternoon bowl tomorrow and then you hit the road Steve. An extended road trip the last road trip of the year to Cleveland. To Detroit which will see a split doubleheader on Monday then the night game on Tuesday day game on Wednesday then it's off to New York. With four games with the Yankees which are critical for the Yankees. Snag. Nice play by the White Sox. Jose Abreu, and that's a double play. So we go to the bottom of the first, coming up for the White Sox. We'll have it for you on my 50 here from U.S. Cellular. Eaton leading it off. He's a designated hitter tonight. Then Carlos Sanchez, Jose Abreu, Melky Cabrera with Abacel Garcia, J.B. Shuck, Rob Brantley, Mike Oak, Tyler Saladino rounding it out. The defense and how they'll line up behind Cody Martin, Mark Canna, Sam Fold, and Jake Smolinski in the outfield with Brett Lowry, Marcus Simeon, Eric Sogard, and Billy Butler in the infield. Carson Blair behind the plate. Cody Martin on the hill. Originally drafted and signed by the Atlanta Braves. This season with Oakland and Atlanta, two and four is ERA, six and a half. Not overwhelming. He's a four pitch pitcher, and he's got to, like most pitchers, get it on the corners to be effective. And for Adam Eaton, he is fifth in the American League with 616 plate appearances. Manny Machado of Baltimore leading the American League with 637. This is the fourth time this season that uh, Adam Eaton has served the White Sox as a DH. There's a big hit to right center, and that ball is going all the way to the wall. Let's see if Eaton rounds the bag at second, headed for third. And Adam Eaton with a stand up triple. That ball crushed into the gap, and Eaton easily into third base. That's his ninth triple of the year. And this ball. Splits fold and Smolinski. They've got no chance. And then Adam with the play in front of him doesn't really even need a third base coach in this situation. He's thinking three bases right when he leaves the batter's box, and three bases it is. So a promising way to start. He's been chewing up the athletics in this series. He's six for 12. Eaton is. And Carlos Sanchez with a deep fly ball to right field. It's got a chance, and this baby is out of here. A two run homer for Carlos Sanchez. Fourth home run of the year. He's now driven in 30. And that didn't take long. This one right there in the inside part of the plate. And he just brings his hands in, gets a good part of the bat on it, gets it up in the wind, and it goes well out of the ballpark. A 
quick two to nothing lead. So the White Sox with Abreu at the plate. And Steve, you gave some of those staggering numbers about what Jose Abreu has an opportunity to accomplish along with Albert Pujols. Well, he needs, Chuck, he needs two more home runs, nine more runs batted in. And he'll be only the second man in history to accomplish a feat that is awfully impressive. That's 30 plus home runs, 100 plus runs driven in. In his first two years of baseball, only Albert Pujols with the Cardinals, 2001 2002, have accomplished that. And this game, as you know, has been around a long time. There's been a lot of great players that came through. But nobody's been able to do it except for Albert to this point. How about this, Steve? You know, I, I was thinking about that stat, and it's a great one that you raised and as it surfaced. I thought maybe Mark McGuire had accomplished it. His rookie year, McGuire had 49 homers and 118 RBIs. His second season, 32 homers. One RBI short of 100. How about that? He had 99 that year. That was the slimmer, Mark. McGuire. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. But Abreu having a monster second half and he just struck out. Martin throwing tonight is a strange scenario. Jesse Chavez was supposed to start this game. And Jesse got up yesterday and couldn't breathe very well. And the reason was he had taken the line drive off his hip. That was in his last start. Somehow in flinching or something along those lines, because it wasn't because he got hit by the ball, but he broke a rib. And they just found out about it. And so Martin hasn't thrown in eight days. Didn't have any idea he was going to throw here tonight. And was brought to the ballpark. They told him, get ready. Here's the baseball. You're going to start. So this is, you would say, an emergency start. And it also brought up a guy that you talked to today who wouldn't have been here otherwise. And it's kind of unusual to see what happens in baseball. Yeah, we have a lot of great storylines to uh, tell you about tonight with Barry Zito. Well, Barry Zito was the guy that wasn't supposed to be here. He was home. His season had ended. And then because of the Chavez situation and the Martin situation, they said to Barry Zito, come on back. Throw a couple of baseballs, work out. He threw before the game today. What ideally they would like him to do is go head to head with Well, they're playing the Yankees. And Tim Hudson is retired. Yeah, Tim Hudson is scheduled to start in Oakland in a series that's already sold out. Yes. And ideally what they'd love to see is Barry Zito start against Tim, Tim Hudson, Hudson in the final game that Tim Hudson ever pitches in the major league. Yeah, Bob Melvin was talking about that, said it would be great for the Bay Area, great for baseball. We have two Cy Young Award winners in the house tonight, folks. Barry Zito, along with our very own Steve Stone. Although that's where it stops as Melky draws a walk because I don't think you signed for $127 million for six years. Now, Barry you? did pretty well, actually, yes, he did. from his, his years with Oakland before he moved on to San Francisco. He's had a terrific career. He's pitching in the minor leagues this year and trying to work his way back. So Abby Garcia at the plate with the one out and one on two nothing White Sox courtesy of Sanchez with a two run blast to right. There's a ground ball nice play by the shortstop Simeon and the Oakland Athletics have just racked up. At least he gets safe at first but he's out at second. So a fielder's choice and we have two outs now for the White Sox. Terrific play by Marcus Simeon as he dove to his right, keeping the ball out of left field. It looked like a base hit. Avi runs too well to get doubled, but it's a very close play at first. This is a pretty good effort. Mm -hmm. And he makes a good solid throw to Sogard. Eric comes across the bag, gets the throw off, but not quite in time to turn two. DJ Rayburn on the call. I'll bring on J.B. Shuck. Speaking of pretty good fourth outfielders, Steve, we talked about Sam Fold. 
When called upon, J.B. Shuck has done a fine job for the White Sox. I thought he's had a terrific year. And coming off the bench late is a very difficult thing to do because you're facing usually the team's best in a key situation. And J.B. has filled that role also. Can play any one of the three outfield positions pretty well. J.B. is one for five of the series. No homers, 14 RBIs, batting 274. Another thing he gives you, which is invaluable, is speed. He's got a whole lot of that. Beautiful night here in Chicago. We have had some splendid weather. Just around 80 degrees at game time, and today is Roberto Clemente Day. As you can see, Roberto, who chalked up hit number 3,000 in his last regular season at bat in 1972. I believe it was against John Matlack. And the fans, everybody was screaming and yelling for him to come up with number 3,000. Obviously, nobody could have known that he was going to take a flight with relief supplies to Nicaragua to help in the earthquake that had gone on there and that torn up the country. And he did. And unfortunately, that was the last at bat that Roberto Clemente ever had in the regular season. Now, Steve, I know you were just coming into the big leagues around that period. Did you face him? I did. I did face him, and it was a unique experience for a couple of different reasons. And we'll get to him after this pop-up is caught. And Sibian with a nice grab, and that's going to end the inning. We're going to pick that uh, up in a moment. But again, the White Sox with a 2 nothing lead, courtesy of Sanchez with a homer off Martin. We'll return right here on My 50 from U.S. Cellular. Who will be back tomorrow afternoon here in Chicago for the fourth and final game of the series before the White Sox leave for 11 straight on the road joined alongside Cy Young Award winner in Steve Stone and Steve before the uh, little pop fly out to end the first we were talking about Roberto Clemente and uh, the fact that you actually faced him uh, early in your career and talk about that for a moment. Well first of all. I did cherish, especially in remembrance, all the Hall of Famers I got a chance to face, and Clemente was one of those at the same time on his team was Willie Stargell. I do remember facing Clemente, and I was struck by how far he stood away from the plate. 
he was way back and you look at hitters now you see where can is standing yes he's right up on top of the plate he's about halfway in the box Clemente was at the back of the batter's box as far away from the plate as you could get in fact it almost looked like there was nobody on the outside part of the plate at all and so you try to throw the ball over the outside corner you see how close Canna is there you try to throw a ball in the outside corner and if you got it there pretty much was a strike if you moved it in an inch he doubled off the right center field wall and he was unique to throw to was a great player a lot of people don't realize what a great arm he had what a wonderful outfielder he was some would say he's as good as anybody who ever played in right field that's anytime you make a statement like that it's arguably there'll be someone who says well what about this guy or that guy Clemente was one of those guys you didn't run on if you did he probably threw you out and he was a pretty good clutch hitter and played on some great pirate teams. Yes, he did. So, I mean, he destroyed Baltimore in the 71 World Series. Yes. Kind of at the plate, but uh, Roberto Clemente, you know, Steve, very few times can you say intimidating in baseball. He was an intimidating type of player because of the tool set he had. His skills were off the charts and the way he ran the bases. Yeah, I think he was, I thought he was a great player. I thought intimidation wise, Stargell was a little more intimidating. Only because Willie was a monster. And it draws a walk. It's going to bring on Billy Butler. And this is a guy that will ground into a double play a lot. So if Eric can keep the ball on the ground, you're going to turn a pair. Because Butler can do a lot of things. One of them is not run. And he perennially perennially leads every team he's played on in double plays this year he's grounded into 23 of them and he leads the team by a wide margin he's in a pretty good zone those seven multi-hit games over the past 15 batting 396 and that span went three for six last night in the first year of a three-year 30 million dollar deal they struggled last year with Kansas City yeah, I mean, they got him Chuck thinking that he would make up for the right-handed power they've missed in Letting Cespedes go and trading Donaldson, that's a big gap from the right side for Oakland. They thought that Butler would be able to help make up that gap. Well, Butler's a line drive hitter. He's not really a power hitter, and of course, he hasn't been able to do it. And he goes the opposite way, and that ball is going to go foul. So, as far as Butler is concerned, and we look at the fact that you know he's a very good hitter although he struggled as we mentioned a season ago was this a good pickup for Oakland based on the ballpark he's playing in I think Oakland felt obviously when you make an obligation of 30 million for three it was a good pickup and they felt perhaps that big ballpark and the fact that the last three years especially the batting average had come down each and every year you know in 2012 he hit 29 home runs in that big ballpark he drove in 107. But the next year he hit 289 with 15 and 82. And then last year, 271, 9 and 66. So the graph, if you were to chart it out, mm -hmm. it wasn't a good direction. It was going straight down. And Billy's a good solid player, but if you were looking as they were for him to pick up the slack for runs batted in, probably not the guy. A ball and two strikes, nobody out here. Billy Butler at the uh, plate after Kenna drew a walk here in the second inning. Well, Butler gave a recent interview with a reporter from the San Jose Mercury, and he said, This is on me. He said, No excuses. I've got to play better, period. I think that's pretty refreshing. And one of the things that at this point is not refreshing as I look out to Eric Johnson's effect that for whatever reason he's taking a whole lot of time tonight and this is most unusual from the guy that we saw the last two starts. But Billy is right. And what's refreshing is seeing a player that is going to take some accountability because in this day and age you don't see it a great deal. This is a year where he's hitting in the mid 250s. 11 home runs. He has yet to hit 60 runs batted in. So, you know, you have bad years. Depends on how he bounces back from it. Count remains at one and two. 
Canada takes off for second and then fortunately for the White Sox Brantley's throw was wide of the back but that's going to be a wild pitch. And for Tyler Saladino that's a pretty good play. This is not a throw that Rob Brantley should have made because there's no chance at all to get Canna at second base. This ball bounces away far enough and as you can see I don't care who's throwing it. You're just not going to get him. So this ball off the mark and Tyler able to back up and make sure that there's no advance. Yeah Saladino playing at short tonight. Ult is at third Sanchez at second and Abreu at first. Ball hit off to the right side. Butler does his job at the runner advance to third. That's just smart baseball right there. Well, he was just trying to put the bat on the ball. Happened to get a slider low and away, actually. He did make contact. It worked out very well. And now, this early in the game against a pitcher that Robin feels he'll probably score against. There's no reason to bring the infield in. So you're going to concede the run on the ground ball to stay out of the big inning. Brett Laurie at the plate. Laurie coming over from Toronto in the Donaldson trade. And you know, Laurie is from Canada. And when he became a Blue Jay, he was a very celebrated star in Toronto. He hails from the British Columbia area on the west coast of the uh, country. But when the uh, Jays had a chance to uh, get Donaldson, they had to make that move. I think they would have traded a province to get him personally. <laughs> as popular as he right. was. We're giving you Manitoba. Yeah, I mean, be my guest. Take <laughs> take a, take your pick. I'm getting a guy who's probably going to be the MVP this year, so pick out who you want. Two and one the count with one out here in the top of the second. Two nothing White Sox and a two run homer by Sanchez traded for. We traded you for Quebec. Yes. Fly ball to left. Melky under it. The tag. And we're going to have a two one ball game. So RBI number 58 on a towering fly ball to left field. Actually, Melky made a pretty good throw, but there's no way that Canna couldn't have scored on that. So 2 1 White Sox here in the top of the second inning. That's going to bring on Eric Sogard, who tripled last night, and for the A's, that was their 37th of the season, tying. The 74 77 is the all time franchise record 68 1968 they had 40. It's an Oakland franchise. That's had some really good teams in the mid 70s obviously three straight World Series appearances three straight world championships 72 they beat the big red machine. Joe Morgan Pete Rose Johnny Bench 73 they came back. Beat the New York Mets and Tom Seaver then 74 polished it off. Against the Dodgers. I don't think we're going to see much of that anymore. But I will tell you one thing that all those great teams that you mentioned, they were great teams, five division titles, three world championships consecutively. What they didn't do, what this team did, they've used 29 pitchers this year. That's an all time record for the athletic organization dating back to Philadelphia. Did you say 29? 29, and if Barry Zito does indeed go, he will be the 30th pitcher they will have used this year. And 22 are relievers. And I think they're all in the pen as we speak. Because last night, the night before, they just kept coming in. They've got 11 relievers. That's crazy. Yep. So guard a 244 hitter. Three for six last night. Sogard, a utility top ball player, but nonetheless, his first big league homer came off Bartolo Colon. And what incredible season Colon is having for the Mets, who are running away right now with the National League East. Just about every time you believe that that's it for Bartolo. The end of the career was a good one. Ah, we'll miss you, Bart. He just comes bouncing right back as he did this year. 
rip fouled off to the right. Well, the thing I love it when it, when I watch the uh, highlights on uh, MLB Network with Bartolo at the plate. I mean, he's turned into a pretty good hitter. Yeah, not bad. And New York, 83 and 62 coming into How action. About that? Winners of eight of their last ten. They lead Washington by eight and a half games. Sogard draws a walk. So the athletics now with two outs and Sogard on at first. Jake Smolinski at the plate. Last time we saw Jake, Steve, well, I was working with you, and uh, Smolinski was patrolling left field for the Texas Rangers in that series in uh, late May, early June. And he can swing the bat pretty well, although you'd never know it by that batting average, but he's swung it in this series well. From the Rockford area, was an outstanding high school quarterback for Boylan Catholic. 2-11 in the series. Overall four homers, 20 RBIs, batting 180. You made a great point last night, Steve. As uh, Brantley's going to have a trip to the mound to talk to Johnson about Cespedes. Speaking of the Mets, they really turned it around when Cespedes was picked up in a trade. But you talked about when Cespedes took a lot of pressure off a young Oakland ball club. And even though the fact that he didn't speak much of any English, he was the spotlight for this team. And the other guys around him could play and thrive and do what they want to do. But everybody would then, through an interpreter, go to Cespedes after the game to find out what was going on. And so I think a lot of times when a front office, any front office, when they make a deal, sometimes they don't take into consideration how the ripple effect on the ball club is going to be, not necessarily from a production standpoint, but from an emotional standpoint. And Cespedes departing was very difficult for the A's last year. 2-1 pitch with two outs. Well, Cespedes, a lot of people, and, and again, we have a lot of storylines to work with our viewers tonight on My 50 uh, regarding the National League MVP. And a number of people believe that Cespedes should be in the mix for that. I would say had he gotten there a little sooner, well, you might it. be right. Absolutely. He's also a free agent, by the way, which helps. This is a complete different Eric Johnson than we saw. He's about ready to deliver pitch number 33. In the inning. Yes. And the ball just goes out of play. Well, that ball was in fair territory for quite some time, and all of a sudden it got up in the wind, and the wind just blew it out of play. So Smolensky will get it. Another opportunity as you see the wind very much a factor here tonight. And if you take a fly ball with anything on it into left field it's probably going to go out of the ballpark. 2 1 White Sox here in the top of the second. In shallow right. Carlos Sanchez near, near the line makes the grab and will go to the bottom of the second. And with the White Sox holding a 2 1 lead on my 50.
by Jeff Vukovic, your local insurance-wide agent, nationwide insurance agent, serving the area for 37 years. To join the nation, visit jeffvuk.com because Nationwide is on your side. Chuck Swirsky along with Steve Stone. The Hawk returns tomorrow afternoon in the series finale. We go to the bottom of the second with Rob Brantley stepping in against Martin. Martin picked up from Atlanta in July for an international slot. That was the trade that amounts nearly 400,000 for the athletics. Martin pitched for Gonzaga. Normally you think of Gonzaga as a basketball school that's produced a one time NCAA player of the year in Adam Morrison, also Kelly Olenek. But uh, he did a fine job pitching for the Bulldogs for Gonzaga with the Western Conference crown. Brantley swings, shallow center field, and right there, make it a catch is fooled, who covers a lot of ground. Stephen, we have our picks to click, so the crew going with uh, Saladino. You're going with Melky in my pick. Adam Eaton. Well, I would say right now you're looking pretty good. I thought for sure I took Sanchez, but apparently the crew reminded <laughs> me that I took Melky. I actually wanted to go with Wayne Nordhead, but um, couldn't get Wayne on the old side. I think Wayne or Lamar Johnson would have been the key yes. for you here tonight. I love Lamar Johnson. For those of you White Sox fans, remember Lamar as a player in the 70s and 80s? Mike Hull steps in and for old one for ten in the series. Getting a look see for the White Sox. As he is patrolling third base with Saladino playing short tonight. And again, this is an opportunity for Olt really to uh, revitalize his career with an opportunity for the remaining couple of weeks left in the season to he, see what he can show. As I say, he's had a few shots at it, and this is another shot for him. There is no secret that the Sox are looking for an answer at third base. And anytime you get an opportunity to start a major league game for any length of time, you got to make the most of it because you never know when that opportunity is not going to come back. When was the last really good third baseman here, Steve? I'm trying to think. Joe Creedy was actually yes, a terrific third baseman, and if not for the back injury, he probably would have been here a long time. But injuries, there's not much you can do, but Joe was really good. Yes, he was. 2-2 two -two pitch with one out here. As Old works the count. And Robin was a pretty good one also. You better believe it. He was there a little bit before Joe. And spent a lot of time in the major leagues. Doing really well. A little chopper over the mound with the spin. Martin throws and he got him. I'm not so sure he did. And Robin is going to take a look at it. For whatever reason, Martin took an inordinate amount of time getting this ball to first base. And Robin is checking right now, so he doesn't want Saladino quite yet to get up there. See Martin turn around, take his time. Took a lot of time, actually. And he got him by a half step. So with two outs, as Saladino batting 239, four homers, 20 RBIs. Now Steve, you've seen Saladino at third for the majority of the uh, season. Talking with Tyler earlier this year, he loves playing short, and that's his natural position. Well, there's no doubt, and he showed everybody that he can play third base. However, He's probably not going to drive in the runs or have the power that a third baseman would need on an everyday basis in the major leagues. He can, however, also play shortstop. 
So for him this year every chance he gets to play there he's got to impress because most likely he goes to spring training next year was certainly an opportunity to do just that. Pending what the Sox decide to do with Alexi Ramirez he's the incumbent there and they've got an option on his services. Yeah a lot of uh, questions going into the offseason of course those things will sort itself out in due time. And there's the pitcher there's the man who went to the mound. And actually looked like a pitcher through 90 miles an hour last night. And that was Alexei Ramirez, who looked very comfortable on the hill. Yep. I spoke to Alexei uh, prior to the ball game, and uh, we're going to uh, maybe show a little of Alexei and with a story about his career as a pitcher in Cuba. There's no doubt in my mind, and I said it as soon as he warmed up that he obviously had done a great deal of pitching in his career because he looked he looked like he really knew what he was doing, and the appeal to first base. So there's the walk. And let's take a look at last night. You'll take a look at a guy that has a pretty good idea about what he's doing. Also, twice he was able to get over the first base. This is a long fly that stayed in the ballpark. And then a terrific play by the aforementioned Tyler Saladino. Alexi's used to doing that at shortstop. This time he was a beneficiary of some pretty good defense. And I thought he looked really good. Adam Eaton stepping in. Eaton let off the. Uh Ball game for the White Sox with a triple. But speaking with Alexi prior to the ball game, and I, and I said, What about your career? He said, I pitched in Cuba until I was 15 years young. And he said, Then they wanted me to become a position player. I said, So tell me, what did you throw last night? He said, I went slider, I went fastball, I also tried a splitter. Hey. But you, you're right, just his mannerisms on the mound, he, he looked like he, he knew looked what he like was he doing. Was a pitcher. I think that splitter is something he probably wants to abandon. I'm not sure how many opportunities he's going to get. That was his first opportunity ever to pitch. It was. And here's an opportunity to steal a base because Blair doesn't have a great arm. Well, we saw Fegley in this series. Boat is still out. Boat is hurt. Fegley does have a good strong arm, a little bit stronger than Blair's. And a pretty good lead at first base. A one pitch with two outs here in the bottom of the second. Speaking with Adam Eaton prior to the ball game, he loves his alma mater, Miami of Ohio. He said, "You know, Chuck, we won our opener. We beat Presbyterian. It's, it's fantastic." He said, "But last Saturday, not so good." I said, "What happened?" He goes, "Nebraska went at 55 to nothing." <laughs> so much for the Red Hawks. Well, we have a, a lot of players on the field tonight representing both teams that played collegiately in terms of baseball, especially Cal. A lot of Golden Bears on the field for both teams. There certainly are those. Marcus Simeon, one of them. Mark Kenna, another one of those guys. And Eric Johnson played with those two on the 2011 he was a Golden on Bear team. Eden swings and misses, tagged out. That'll end the bottom of the second. 2 1 ball game, White Sox, right here in Chicago.
Harper in Chicago with the White Sox holding a 2-1 lead over the Oakland Athletics. Chuck Swirsky filling in for the Hawk, who returns tomorrow afternoon, joined alongside by Steve Stone. Carson Blair steps in against Eric Johnson. Carson hit his home run in Texas. That's the one home run, the one run driven in that he's had. Yeah, the irony of that ball game when he hit the home run, he grew up 30 miles away from the ballpark in Texas, Globe Live Park. So quite a milestone. Carson, who was actually drafted by the Red Sox in 2008, but had to wait until September the 6th to make his major league debut, and he goes down. You can join us at U.S. Cellular Field on Saturday, October the 3rd. White Sox hosting the Tigers at 6:10. And the first 10,000 fans will receive an exclusive stretch sale action figure. For tickets, visit WhiteSox.com. We talk about the Texas Rangers and Texas. Has taken a half game lead over Houston. That in the American League West. Texas won the ball game. They've won three in a row. Houston has lost two in a row to Texas. And for the first time in a long time, they've relinquished their hold on first place. But Sam Fool, who singled in the first, steps in. Yeah, I want to talk about this, Steve, as far as the American League West with, uh, as you mentioned, Texas, Houston, L.A. I'm not sure about Seattle, major disappointment. Is Houston starting to feel, it's a young club starting to feel the pressure, you think? I don't know if they feel the pressure as much as they feel the fact that Texas is a pretty good baseball team. And Houston hasn't been there yet. They don't have the experience. A lot of those Rangers, led by now a healthy Adrian Beltre, have been there before. They've been there a lot. And there's something to be said for experience. Texas has it. Texas is leading Houston seven to nothing in the mm. bottom of the third in Texas tonight. So that's a ball club that's going straight up. Houston is a young ball club that has never been there before. They will be better off next year for what's happened this year. I'm not sure if they can hold off the Rangers. Well, it's, it's really healthy for baseball when you have a ball club like Houston and Texas battling this race. Yeah, I don't know what's happened with the Angels, Steve, but it certainly appears the Angels are probably going to be on the outside. We have baseball to be played, I get this, but it appears they're going to be on the outside looking in. There's a line shot to Saladino at short. Well, the Angels still three and a half games back in the wild card. There are two games in back of Minnesota. Minnesota a game and a half in back of Houston. So there's still a terrific wild card race in the American League. Yeah, how about the Twins? They just won't go away. Everyone thought they were dead about a month ago. We saw them here on this homestand, and they've got some very good young players. Miguel Sano is a good one. Eddie Rosario is another good one. They've got some veteran players in Torrey Hunter, who've been there before a lot. So they've got some talent. They just don't have the overwhelming pitching, but they're hanging around. And the longer you hang around, the better it is as you go down the stretch. Simeon with a base hit to left field. He's one for two. Two outs here in the top of the third. The wild card standings, and I love the fact that Major League Baseball with two wild cards they have a play-in game. And Steve, why don't you take us through that? Well, as you see, it's the Yankees. And then Houston for the moment. Minnesota game and a half back. The Angels three and a half back. Cleveland is five back. Cleveland's starting to play good baseball. They lead Kansas City tonight five to nothing. That game in the middle of the sixth inning in Cleveland. But you love the fact that there is a play in game. I think eventually, Chuck, they'll probably modify the format. I like the idea of a two out of three. I think that's a pretty good idea. The one and done game is so difficult. It's hard enough to get into the playoffs as it is. And then to have your whole season decided on a one and done game doesn't seem hardly like it's a great thing. So two of three seems to be the best. And the idea of playing a double header maybe the first day and a single game the second day seems to be pretty good. That way you're using three pitchers. Fly ball deep center field near the track. 
And the out is consummated by Shuck. So we go to the bottom of the third here in Chicago. Interesting point about uh, a best of three there. And we'll talk about that. Great storylines here. We'll return in a moment. White Sox with a 2-1 lead. and an official White Sox debit card only available at your local Wintrust Community Bank. Go to Wintrust.com slash White Sox to learn more. Wintrust Community Bank, member FDIC. Carlos Sanchez leads off for the White Sox here in the bottom of the third. Sanchez with a two-run shot to right in the first inning of play. He went up and out over the plate, hit his fourth home run of the year. And a triple and a home run later was two to nothing before anybody was out. So Chopper charged it short and the throw to first, and he just beat him. Nice play by Simeon. So you think as as Sanchez, he has cemented himself going into spring training as the day in, day out second baseman, Steve? No. You don't I do not. I believe that there's going to be a lot of candidates for second base. I believe that it's going to be a situation where although Carlos has been very good and he's been very good this year and probably going to get better. I think that there's going to be a few people they take a look at and then see what happens. I mean we see open competitions in spring training a lot. Let me say that he's got the inside track. But you never really know what's going to happen over the winter time, and you certainly don't know what's going to happen in spring training. With Jose Abreu. He struck out in the first inning of play. Jose once again having a monster season in his second year with the White Sox. The reigning American League rookie of the season that of course will change in a few months when the awards come out. And we're going to talk about those awards because we have some pretty good candidates. And I might add in both the leagues. Yeah we'll take a look and find out. Who we believe will win the awards, although it certainly is pending the last 20 or so odd games, a little bit less in some instances. Three oh count with one out here to Abreu. All right, Stephen, so you tell me these are my postseason awards. The MVP, Josh Donaldson and Bryce Harper. The rookies of the year, Carlos Correa and Chris Bryant. The Cy Young Award, well, you can just take Chuck's name off, put Steve's name on, and they would look exactly the same. Really? Yep. See, I, I, I've got to ask you a question about the National League Cy Young. Abreu with a deep drive. Center field. 
And this baby is out of here. A solo blast for Jose Abreu. And the White Sox with a 3-1 lead. Second home run of the night for the Sox. 29 for the year. 92 driven in. And as Jose gets ever closer to 30 and 100. He sneaks ever closer to history. The Mazda replay this looked like a slider that didn't slide. It was out over the middle of the plate. Jose absolutely crushed it. Fold goes back but there's no place for him to go as that ball goes out of the yard. Jose Abreu he is he is really worth the price of admissions Steve and I, and I I'm very careful when I say those things because it's easy to toss it around. But he he comes to play and he is a professional hitter. He know he, he's a smart baseball player. And he had some lulls in this year and I think they were largely due to some injury aspects yep. and he didn't like to talk about it doesn't talk about it doesn't make any excuses. That's one of the things you love about him. But he comes every day prepares himself to work. And. It's been great to watch over these almost two years now and you got to feel that the best is yet to come. Just a pleasure and Cabrera will draw a walk here. You see we we showed the graphic one more time and John and Jimmy in the truck if we can show those picks one more time. Thank you Steve. Here's my situation with the National League Cy Young. I took Abrietta because the Cubs have come out of nowhere. They're having a magnificent year. But you've got Granky, you got Clayton Kershaw, and you got Arietta. I mean, Granky's having an incredible season, but I took Arietta just because he's been, I mean, without him, the Cubs are not in that position. Yes, but there's a couple of things you should bear in mind. Okay. And you picked, in my estimation, the right guy. But this is it. Okay, so we picked the exact same guys. You picked Jake Arrieta, so did I. Um, when you have two guys on the same team mm -hmm. having great years, as you have with Kershaw and Granke, many times, especially in major cities like Los Angeles, they're going to split the vote because they both get a lot of publicity. Granke's had a magnificent year. Kershaw is doing better and better with every passing start. So assuming that you get a lot of Dodger fans or you get people who watch the Dodgers a lot, they're going to get a certain amount of people that will vote for Granky and they'll vote for Kershaw. But there isn't another Cub pitcher doing close to what Arietta is doing, and you can't take what the Cubs are doing into consideration for Arietta. You look at the numbers, it is a Scion Award, it's really termed the most valuable pitcher. You look at the numbers, you see what he's done, and Arietta probably will win his 20th game of the year tonight at Pittsburgh. The Cubs are leading two to nothing that game. Going into the bottom of the sixth inning, Arietta has had a streak the latter portion of this season that is arguably as good as there is in baseball. So that's why I think because the vote will be split, I think Arietta wins the Cy Young Award. And also, you, I do believe he deserves it, it. And Steve, the fact he tossed a no no talking about Arietta, did the, it, will that have any influence on a voter, do you think? No. I mean, it's nice, it's wonderful, it's a great honor. I think they'll look at the body of work. I think that's what you look at the body of work when you consider this particular award. One two count with an out for Garcia. Nice play at third for Laurie and over to second. It's a fielder's choice. That's a couple of good infield plays already. He dove to his left. Keeping this ball out of left field for the moment and then from his knees a good pinpoint throw they get the force out that's all they could get. What I also picked Chuck and you didn't pick at this point I want you to think about it I don't want to put you on the spot now. But you are a fan of the game a lot of people don't realize because you do basketball that you are a great baseball fan. I want you to think about executive of the year in both leagues because I went on to pick those also. Mm. Okay. So think about it for a bit and we'll get back to it a little later. J.B. Shuck, 0 for 1, flat out to short in the first. A couple out here. 3-1 White Sox. They've gone long ball tonight with Sanchez in the first with a two-run blast, then Abreu with a solo shot 
here in the third. White Sox in Oakland come out to the ballpark tomorrow. Afternoon baseball. And then the Sox hit the road. Cleveland, Detroit, and then the Yankees. And the Yankees still knocking on that door for first in the American League East, battling the Toronto Blue Jays. Going the other way. Shuck, left field. Nice grab by the left fielder. Hina, and that'll do it here in the bottom of the third. 3 1 White Sox. We go to the for the moment, right here on my 50. Sox with a 3-1 lead in game three of a four-game series and a bizarre series to say the least. 14 in an affair in game one where we had 35 collective strikeouts, 17 pace on balls, 15 pitchers, and it went over five hours to play and a total of 495 pitches thrown. And then last night, well, it was all open. Unfortunately, it was shocking early. 10 run fourth. And that was after a five run first. And that was about it. Kind of leading off for uh, Oakland. Kind of a rookie for the Athletics. Started his career with the Marlins, then went to Colorado as a Rule 5 draft, and then uh, traded in the offseason. And that Rule 5, you can pick up some pretty good players, folks. And a couple come to mind. We talked earlier in the broadcast about Roberto Clemente. He was a Rule 5 player from the Dodgers to the Pirates. And George Bell went from Philadelphia to Toronto as a Rule 5 player. Of course, George Bell played here not only with the White Sox, but also the Cubs. There's another pretty good one by the name of Johan Santana. Yes. Rule 5 draft. And last night, Kenna got on base six times. Mm. A couple of walks, three hits, got hit by a pitch, scored a couple of runs, drove in one. It's a pretty busy night for him. Yeah, we uh, discussed earlier with Simeon and Eric Johnson, who's on the mound for the uh, White Sox. Here's a ground ball. Sanchez over to Abreu and Cannon, also a member of that Golden Bear Ball Club in 2011. All right, George, we're going to go to Twitter for Steve Stone. This is an opportunity to just uh, empty the mailbag tonight, folks, <laughs> because this is my, let's see, 15th broadcast with you this year. It is. Filling for Hawk, and I've loved it, Steve. It's not every day I get a chance to work with a Cy Young Award winner. I do work for Bill Wennington. He's I was in the say, Canadian Hall of Fame. It's not every day that I get to work with Bill Wennington's partner. No. 
So at Steve Stone, <laughs> at Steve Stone, or Swirsk, S-W-I-R-S-K, 0 5 4 for Billy Butler, 0 for 1. And we're going to uh, go to the mailbag for Steve because we always have some great, great questions for Steve and some comments. There's a fly ball near the track. Milky with the play. So, Steve, we have a question about your selections regarding Cy Young yeah. and about Keuchel. Yeah. In the American League, is he a clear winner at this point in time, in your opinion? He is a winner, pending just exactly what happens as we move down the stretch. But overall, and this is not. How about David Price? You think? I mean, David Price has done terrific, but again, it, probably yet to be determined. I mean, yeah. we're trying to pick awards now. Sure. And this is the 16th of September, so we've got some time yet. And obviously, David Price had a terrific year. He's second behind Keuchel in run average. He is fourth with 15 wins. Keuchel has 17. So, yeah, Price has been terrific. But right now, for me, he's behind Dallas Keuchel. He's playing for a team that's awfully good, a team that can get him a lot of runs. So we'll see what happens in maybe the last two or three starts that he has left. Brett Lurie going the other way to deep right field. At the track, and it's off the wall. Lori turns the corner at second, puts on the brakes, and that's a stand up double for Brett Lori. Avi was playing fairly shallow as this one stays about belt high away from Brett Lowry. And as Avi goes back, this time he doesn't feel for the wall. He actually jumps too soon, and when he jumps, he ducks his head. He can't see the ball. So take a look at his eyes. You see where his eyes go? No chance at all. And if you locate the fence, then you'll be able to make that play. So now Don Cooper is coming out, making the long, slow walk. He wants to talk with Eric Johnson just about what to do with Sogard, who's been... Pretty much a pain in this series. He's yes, been he a has. pretty good hitter in this series, and he's been pretty good career-wise against our Sox. Right, what, what, what's your opinion of Johnson? What have you seen of him as we go and we're in the fourth inning here? I think the stuff this time is not quite as good as it was the first or second time out. But I think he's battled. I think that's what he does. He's a battler, and that's what he's done this year. Tonight he's working a lot more slowly, and I think one of the things that Don wants him to do is get back to when he was working more quickly, showing the hitter that he has a bit more confidence, and also telling him how they want to get out Sogar. One-0 count, two outs here in the fourth, three-one White Sox. You know, this uh, Oakland Ball Club, a lot of people like some of the pieces that they've got, but they are going to be in a tough division, even forecasting next year. Houston's not going away. Texas not going away. Lazy fly ball to center. This is going to be easy play for Shuck, and that's going to be the end of the inning. So we go to the bottom of the fourth. Sox clinging to a 3-1 lead.
Here it's three to one. The Sox have hit a couple of balls out of the ballpark and Chuck getting another opportunity seeing the Sox at a different stage of the year and this is a stage where the Sox and most ball clubs that are not really in it are looking for the future. So far when you take a look at some of the young guys what do you think. Well I'm excited about Trace Thompson to say the yeah. least. I, I think he is an exciting young ball player has a tremendous ceiling and I'm I'm anxious to see his development throughout not only 2016 Steve but for years to come. I think he he has an opportunity to be a pretty good ball player. And unfortunately, Trace got hurt, but he's not hurt seriously, and we should see him back. In fact, he was almost back in the ball game tonight, but it didn't work out that way. But he will be back in the not too distant future. Boy, he looked just terrific in every aspect of the game, and we're expecting some great things from the young man. Yeah, I talked to uh, Trace prior to the ball game, and he said just that, Steve, that uh, you know he's going to try and give it a go, but doesn't want to rush it. Wants to make sure that when he's able to play, he can play. Period. At nearly 100%, that was a nasty spill he took. But I, um, I said, you know, I hope to see you in late November because, obviously, his brother Clay is a magnificent talent for the NBA champion Golden State Warriors. They're going to host the Bulls in late November, and he lives in Southern California, so maybe you can make that trip north to uh, Oakland at the Oracle. A lot of basketball fans in the White Sox. I talked to Tyler Flowers, who lives in Atlanta. He's going to go see the Bulls play the Hawks. Speaking of catching, Rob Brantley at the plate. Give me an idea right now where the Sox stand with catchers, Steve. Well, I certainly believe that going into next season, it's going to be an opportunity behind the plate. I think they're very happy with many aspects of Tyler Flowers game. I think he's called a pretty good game and I think that next year depending and I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody really knows what happens. Who's going to be out there and available and what particular deals are going to be made. But obviously it'd be a place where the Sox would take a look see what's out there. I think they're going to do that with most positions Chuck. I don't think there's a whole lot nailed down. There's Brantley with a little looper drops in for a base hit. Well, you said the Flowers calls a good game, Steve, and you, you've spoken often about uh, Rick Dempsey, who was an outstanding catcher with you in Baltimore when you won the Cy Young. In this day and age, do catchers actually call the game, or does it come from the dugout? Mark Parent, by the way, celebrating his 54th birthday. He's in the dugout assisting Robin Ventura. So who does and the, just the, the system of delivering a pitch call? I think what happens usually is you find in this case Mark Parent sometimes it's the manager on the other side Bob Melvin is a former major league catcher and a good one so he's probably going to make those calls but as that ball gets away and Brantley on his way to second base so he'll get there easily that is a wild pitch in fact it could be the definition of a wild pitch lands well in front of the plate and Blair tries to backhand it, which is never really too good, but it got away. Mark Parent is going to call pitch outs. He's going to call throws to first. He's going to call slide steps. He's probably not going to do a great deal of the calling of individual pitches. That's going to be the domain of whoever happens to be catching, except if you have a very young catcher, and certainly Gio Soto and Tyler Flowers would not fall into that category. And that ball is well hit. Center field. And this baby is out of here. The White Sox third home run. Mike Wolt. That's his second home run. He's now driven in three. And that one really was a blast. The first home run. The first home run hitter ever to hit a home run for both the Sox and the Cubs in the same season. As Mike Olt absolutely crushes this ball. I mean, this one got up and kept on going. This is Bark at the Park, and that one was barking all the way out there. <laughs> Nicely done. So Sanchez, along with Abreu, and now Olt. All going yard, a two run blast, and it is five to one White Sox. Five, five, and oh for the White Sox, one, three, and oh. 
like they're going through a lot of pitchers right now. They're just hoping that Martin could eat some innings. Well, this is an emergency start for him, and they realize this is a very difficult situation. And so, whatever Bob Melvin can get from Martin, they'll be more than happy to get. Although, again, with 11 relievers, you're not running through that bullpen anytime soon. They only used two of them last night. And that ball is ripped down the left field line. That's headed for the quarter. Here's Saladino. And Saladino with a stand up double. So the White Sox doing damage here in the fourth inning with nobody out. That six hits, only one of them a single. That, the looping single by Brantley leading off the fourth. Yeah, this is a hanging curveball that Tyler just rips right down the line. Lowry got no chance of getting to it. And that is going to be it. As Martin is going to depart this one. As Bob Melvin is forced to go to the pen, so go to the pen he will. We'll step out and be back after these messages. Two pitchers. Well, two pitchers wrapped in the same body as Pat Venditti comes in. We saw him in the opening game of the series. He's one and two, his ERA, 422 on for the 20th time. He pitched an inning in the opener, gave up a hit, a walk, a couple of strikeouts, and as he is ambidextrous, he's able to declare actually which way he's going to pitch depending on who comes to bat. So when Adam Eaton comes to bat, he's going to face him from the left side. It'll be real interesting to see how he faces Sanchez, who's a switch hitter. So there you see the right-handed warm-up, and now you see the left-handed warm-up, both with a specially fitted glove. And what we saw from both sides when he came on to pitch the other night was that he's got a pretty good sidearm slider from both sides. Out of Creighton University, played baseball in Omaha for the Blue Jays. Was a member of the Yankees organization. Adam Eaton, one for two, tripled in the first, struck out in the second. See, during your playing career, did you see anyone of this ilk? No, I did not. Not who could pitch. I see a lot of guys who could throw from both sides. But. Not any you could pitch from both sides. Again, nobody out for the White Sox. Two O count. Well, this Oakland team, Steve, they've got some young players, but as we mentioned, and you know their farm system much better than I do, but they've got a way to go. I think it's going to be pretty tough for them because their division has gotten a whole lot tougher over the last couple of years. Eaton draws a walk. 
Hey, White Sox fans, you can celebrate your culture with Hispanic Heritage Night. October the 2nd, presented by Miller Lite. There will be Latin music, dancing, special activities for the kids at on-field parade, and a post-game fireworks show. It's not just a good time, it is Miller time. Miller Lite, the official beer of your very own Chicago White Sox. So Sanchez got things going in the first with a two-run bomb. One of three White Sox homers tonight. Sox with a 5-1 lead on six hits. Sox with runners at first and second. Sox coming in 68-75. They're a game under 500 at home. Playing 500 ball over the past 10. Athletics. 21 games under 500. Ben Diddy is the first ambidextrous pitcher to play in the major leagues since Greg Harris did in 1995. Harris, I believe, was with what, Texas? He also pitched, I believe, for San Diego. I have to check on that, but. Well, right now, Blair is going out there to yeah. try to figure with Ben Diddy because of what side he throws from. He wants him to get the ball over the plate. Again, all Bob Melvin can do is, you know, who's fresh, who's got an arm. In this case, he's got two arms and for the price of one. And there's Kurt Young, the pitching coach. Who is a pretty good pitcher in his own right. He was a good pitcher. Left-hander. Pitched in those uh, great Oakland ball clubs in the late 80s. Sanchez walks. And just like that, Mr. Stone, the White Sox have the bags loaded here. In the fourth inning, with nobody out. Our fourth drive of the game was that shot that Abreu hit last inning. This one went a long way, not as far as Olds' home run, but far enough. Number 29 is 92nd driven in with a chance to drive in a few more. And Diddy just can't find the plate, period, which is an understatement. He is all over. And here comes Kurt Young. He's going to come out and try to find some way to settle him down. Yeah, well, I mean, what do you say, Steve? I mean, he, he's having all kinds of control problems. He's got the bases loaded. It's a 1 0 count. What do you say to him? I might want to think about getting the ball over the plate. <laughs> and it really doesn't matter which arm you're throwing with. In this case, it's righty to righty, as he's already made a switch. All I can tell you is I'm glad Billy Bean gave, in this case, Bob Melvin a two-year extension. Bob Melvin is an exceptional manager, folks, and he's an incredible person. You know him as well as anyone, Steve, and they love him in Oakland. Well, his contract was going to end at the end of next year. If they allowed him to go anywhere close to the market, he would be snapped up immediately. So Absolutely. they decided to. Tie him down for another couple of years. He wants to stay in Oakland, and that's a good fit for both. Yep, we talked about that Cal Bear connection. Bob Melvin was a pretty good player in Berkeley. And that's exactly why he loves the Bay Area and why he's probably going to stay there for a long time. Solid catcher, he just can't pitch, especially in 2015. 2 0 pitch. Foul back 2 1 for Jose Abreu. That one right down the middle, and he fouled it straight back. And this is very hittable. This doesn't hit it. Two one pitch on its way. Going the opposite field. And it drifts foul to the right. Two and two. He hit it hard. Unfortunately, it sliced well before the pole. Abreu is seven for ten in the series. He is batting 500 against Oakland this season. He's hitting 346 over the past seven games. Other than that, uh, he's okay. And career with the bases loaded, 438. 
That will drift out of play. Made about 20 rows back with the souvenir. Two and two and nobody out here. Bases loaded for the White Sox in the fourth. Diddy and relief uh, Martin and three and two. You know what Jose is thinking right now, don't you? If he gets anything close, he's going to be hacking. Yes, he will. Three two pitch. Nobody out. Bases loaded for the White Sox. Outside and that draws a walk that draws the run in that's the sixth of the night for the White Sox and Abreu picks up an RBI. I'm sure he would have rather been able to swing the bat but instead he settles for a run batted in number 93 as Dan Otero continues to loosen up after three straight walks. You know, the way the teams have gone through pitching staffs in the first two games looks like Oakland probably is going to make a move in the near future unless Vin Diddy gets something going here in the fourth year. I know you're good friends with Bob Melvin. He may place a call. He says, you know, I, I got one Cy Young guy we just, you know, recalled from Nashville and Cito. Steve? He's got a lot of relief pitchers down there. He was six relief pitchers in that 14 inning game. But that still left him with five that he didn't use. For Cabrera. Six one White Sox. Yeah, the one thing that should never happen when you happen to have 11 pitchers is you run out of pitchers. Hit to left field, down the left field line. One run is in, two runs are in. As Abreu stops at third, and that is a two run double for Milky Cabrera, the red hot Milky Cabrera. And that looks like it's going to be it. As Venditti really struggled. Milky's now driven in 70 runs. He takes this one down the line past Lowry. A sweeping breaking ball. And Milky makes it 8 to 1. And yet another trip to the pan. So we'll step out and be back after these messages. The Sox on the beach. Apple vacation 
This seven night all inclusive hotel stay will be at the Iber Star Paraiso del Mar in beautiful Riviera Maya, Mexico. There will be a private welcome party, autograph session, food and drink, special group activities with your White Sox hosts. Visit applevacations.com slash White Sox to book your trip today. Very nice. But we have another pitcher coming out of the pen for Oakland. It's Dan Otero coming in the game. And just like that, it's going to be an out. Simeon came home through a drawn in infield and through to Blair and easily cut down a Bray with the plate. So the infield in wanting to cut off the all important ninth run. And right now, which run is the first and second? There is one out. For J.B. Shuck. 8 1 White Sox. We've had a little of everything in this series, folks. A 14 inning affair on Monday, a blowout by the Athletics. And now it's the White Sox turn to manhandle the Athletics. But still, we have a lot of baseball to be played. 8 1 White Sox here with five in the fourth inning. JB is 0 for 2, flied out to short in the first, grounded out to left. We saw Otero in the opening game, and he pitched a couple of innings, struck out two, gave up a hit, no runs, and actually threw the ball pretty well. Chuck playing center field tonight. We have, uh, again, Twitter questions at Steve Stone, at Swirsk 054, S W I R S K 054. A lot of tweets tonight regarding. We were talking about Trace Thompson, the future of Trace Thompson, and what position he plays, although he's very capable of playing all three. Robin yeah. Ventura he addressed can. that prior to the ball game. Shot with a base hit to right field. And the White Sox once again with the bags loaded here for Brantley. And the Sox have batted around. So something we saw. From the athletics twice last night, two different innings, the athletics batted around. And tonight it's the Sox turn. Brantley is one for two, had a little blooper here in the uh, fourth inning, scored a run. Brantley getting the uh, call tonight behind the plate. So Steve, an answer to that uh, tweet regarding the outfield. We just saw Shuck get a base hit. What do you think of uh, the outfield as it, it kind of we navigate our way to next year with Thompson? You think he's center? You think left, right? You think he's just going to be all over the place? I really don't have an idea where he's going to play necessarily because I don't think Sox have an idea where he's going to play. I think they're comfortable with the fact that he can play anywhere, but you have to see just what deals are made. And there's going to be some deals made. There's going to be some people acquired. There's probably going to be a free agent out there that's going to be somewhat enticing for the Sox. And you never really know what position that guy is going to play. It's a comfort to know that Trace Thompson can play all three positions. And he not only can play them, but he can play them well. He's a good athlete. He's shown that. And he's also shown that he's been a better hitter in the major leagues than he was in the minor leagues. And that's also a, a trend that you hope continues. You would expect that it would. Better lighting. More consistency of everything up here. And the pitchers are around the plate more. It's not unusual for a guy to hit the ball better up here than he hits it down in the minor leagues. Because he's going to see many more strikes. Two and two the count with one out. Otero on the mound. Came out of Duke and the University of South Florida started his career with the Giants organization his third campaign with uh, the athletics claimed on waivers originally March 29th of 2013 slice foul to the right. So Steve then we have another tweet and this is from. Matt C, who has a question for you regarding then are the White Sox going to target a third baseman in the offseason? I think this year they will be targeting 
just about every position every chance they get to try to find a way to improve the baseball team I don't think specifically they're going after one player because who knows who's going to be there I mean the first thing you have to do is figure out who's on the open market then you have to figure out what exactly the payroll is going to be and the payroll is going to be down somewhat and with that there'll be some bucks to spend assuming that the payroll is going to be in the neighborhood of what the payroll was this year and you never really know that's not something that we will interest ourselves in. Here's a ground ball should be two over to second and the first and the first baseman Butler could not complete and the Sox score a run. That's an RBI and probably a double play that should have been made that wasn't it wasn't a good throw to Billy Butler make no mistake about that but Billy Butler has been the designated hitter most of the year. So it looks like it's going to be pretty much six four three and out of the inning. Sogard comes across does not make a good throw and Billy Butler on what appeared to be a relatively easy pick doesn't secure the baseball. So a bad throw not a particularly good pick and it's nine to one and a run batted in the fifth for Rob Brent. So it's six runs here in the fourth inning nine eight no for the White Sox one three and zero oh for Oakland. Oh. Fouled off to the right. Here's a chance to hit two home runs in one inning because this came earlier this inning. Way back. The second home run, he's driven in three. That was a Titanic shot. Sanchez Abreu also went yard tonight. No one count. Round of the third. And the toss to second, and the White Sox, however, pick up six. 9 1 White Sox. We go to the fifth here in Chicago. Nine one lead here in the fifth inning of play Chuck Swirsky filling in for the Hawk who returns tomorrow afternoon in the series finale alongside Cy Young Award winner Steve Stone. And one thing if you're on the mound and you look up at the board it's nine to one. You tell yourself get the ball over the plate if they hit you they hit you just don't walk anybody. Along with the fact you get through this inning you can pick up a dub. With three outs, and that's not lost on anybody who wears a uniform and pitches for a living. 
you're going to start, you better get through five. I have had it happen where I had a five to nothing lead going into the bottom of the fifth on the road in Anaheim. Only to get knocked out of the game at five to three, only to see my team score 14. Saladina with a strong throw. Hey, Sox fans, all season long, you could score with Papa John's Pizza. The day after the Sox score five or more runs, which is tonight, of course, you get 50% off your entire online order at PapaJohns.com with the promo code SOX5 at participating Papa John's locations. Better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. That means we could get some, pick it up on the way to the airport, and eat it on the charter. Oh, goody. Well, again, I will not be traveling. Hawk, of course who is an icon, will be uh, making the road trip to um, Cleveland, Detroit, and New York. And the Hawk has his little nest on the charter flight where he sits. And I'm sure that you had to take that over for him. <laughs> yes. The assortment of candy was delicious, though, I must say. Towering fly ball, easy play made, and so quickly two up, two down, and that's yep. exactly what Eric is doing. He's getting it. He's throwing it, working a lot faster now than he was earlier. Somehow came to a lull in that second inning, a second inning where he didn't give up any hits, did give up a run on two walks and a sacrifice fly. He did slow it down, and I think that's what Don Cooper went out there and talked to him about, about getting the cadence back, get back to the rhythm that you have done so well and go with it. For Sam Fould, who's uh, one for two, four for 12 in the series. Fould diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was 10. And at the age of 12, he met Bill Gullickson, who, by the way, is from Joliet, who was an outstanding pitcher in his own right with the Expos, who had diabetes. And he talked to then a very young Sam Fould for about 10 minutes. And Sam Fould said, I'll never forget that conversation. And now, anytime I can talk to young diabetic kids, I look forward to that opportunity. And that was one of the things that former White Sox player and Cub great Ron Santo used to do so well. Talk yes. with so many of the young diabetic, not only baseball players, but diabetic children who did other activities, letting them know that you can manage it, you can certainly play a particular sport or sports with it and I think they're getting better and better now than ever before but it is something that you see the indelible impression that was left on Sam Fold all these years later. Yes very much so. Fold from Stanford played for the Cardinal. Kenny Williams went to Stanford the executive yes, vice president of the White Sox I'm trying to think who else went to Stanford for the white Jack McDowell went to Stanford. Carlos Quinton went to Stanford. Stanford. In fact, I think he played with Sam Fold in Palo Alto. Maybe the best player to ever come out of Stanford. Would you say it's Mike Musina? The best collegiate baseball player, player coming out of Stanford, who had a great career out of Stanford to the pro. Simeon swings and misses. We'll have to put our thinking caps on as Simeon goes down swinging. Eric Johnson's found a nice groove, allowing just three hits for the run. We go to the bottom of the fifth. White Sox with a 9 1 lead.
SoxTV.com and click on the WGN Sports Game Zone banner for the latest stats and information. The Sox Game Zone is powered by Robert Morris University, Illinois, offering over 55 athletic teams. That's more than any other university in the state. For more information on RMU, visit robertmorris.edu. So Tyler Saladino stepping in here in the bottom of the fifth after the White Sox put together a magnificent six-round fourth to open up this ball game with a 9-1 lead. And I had a trick answer for your question about Stanford. To me, it's John Elway. Uh -huh. Who was drafted, played in the Yankee organization. That's right. Now, quite obviously, we know he probably wasn't quite as famous as a baseball player as he became as one of the great football players of our time or any time. Well, Elway was the first pick in the draft in 83 by the Colts. Didn't want to play for the Colts and then was traded to Denver. But he, as Steve mentioned, played in the Yankee system. Yes, he did. He threatened to uh, play baseball, which he did. But I think he, as you mentioned, you got me on that trivia question, Steve. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a bit better as a football player. And, of course, the White Sox can't forget Joe Borcher out of Stanford. Mm -hmm. Fly ball to right. And a running diving play and nice hustle and an effort. But Jake Smolinski made just a terrific effort as that ball slicing away from him. And he went across to make the play. But came up a little short. Not for lack of trying. Well, the guy that's going to put that Stanford degree to work now that he's out of a job, Ruben Amaro. He was released. Ruben Amaro's by... a good guy, yes, and I'm is. hoping that he falls on his feet someplace. So the roller to second. So guard. Over the butler, one down here for the White Sox. Hey, Sox fans, for great seats. Get to StubHub where there's no surprise fees at checkout. The price you see, the price you get. StubHub, the official fan-to-fan -fan ticket marketplace at WhiteSox.com. Well, one thing Ruben Morrow did with Philadelphia, he left Andy McPhail and Morrow's successor as GM, and they're shopping around for a GM right now, Steve Stone, with a pretty robust farm system. Yeah, they've got, they've got a good farm system. And you know what I found more and more, Chuck, is that when we talk about a general manager or a player. I say more and more. I was good friends with his father. That mean going the other way, drifting off. And that's a real good play by Canna because he had to get an angle as that ball wasn't hit above the lights. It was hit right into the lights. And when that happens, for an outfielder, you've got to get an angle or you're not going to see the ball. And although he knows off a left-handed bat, the ball's going to slice in toward him. He goes across and you see it. Well, you see it here. He finally does pick it up and has the ball stick in the glove. But if he doesn't turn exactly the right place to the side, he's got some problems. Good description there. Canada did get a good uh, jump on the ball, but you're right. That came right at him. And he is an outfielder by trade. We've seen him at first base in this series. But the way he swings the bat looks like he could be a valuable member of this team going forward. And really a, ch a challenge for Billy Bean. I was going to say, I heard you and Hawk talk about him last night. You love his upside. Yeah, I, I think that he swings the bat real well. And could very well be that he's just coming to the age now where he's starting to learn what pitchers are trying to do with him. And it could very well be that Oakland might have got him at the right time. Because I think he's got some big pop in that bat. Sanchez going the other way. Right on cue there for Canada who makes the grab with one two three getting retired and it's nine one White Sox we go to the sixth.
Welcome back. Hawk Harrelson returns tomorrow afternoon. And the White Sox celebrating the birthday of Gordon Beckham. Along with Mark Parent, there is uh, Beckham turning 29 years young. He's just a very young man. As Georgia Bulldogs you know, light it up in the SEC this year, they are flat out loaded. Tell me about Beckham, and, and you know, I, he loves the game so much. He's a wonderful guy in the clubhouse, obviously, Steve, but he has just not found that groove. I Offensively, think it, I think his groove is going to be he has a swing player and a guy that can play a lot of different positions for you. As far as playing every day is concerned, you never know really what happens where your opportunities come, but Gordon tries to stay ready and make the most of what he's been given. And he's got some value for a team that intends to be in contention. And hopefully that will be the Sox next year. There's a lot of work to be done before that happens. Well, he, he really is a consummate team guy, always very much an encourager in that locker room, the clubhouse. I've seen it firsthand covering the uh, ball club. Saladino, rifles the throw over the first for one out here. By the way, in Washington's 12 to 2 win over Philadelphia, mm -hmm. Bryce Harper hit his 40th home run. He's got 92 driven in. So, what a year it's been to a man that. Chuck and I both believe will be the MVP in the National League, but let's get to guys who will have an opportunity to perhaps win the executive of the year okay. in the National League. And this is not something that we had graphically. No, we didn't. So I sprung this on you. Well, I'm going with Tell the tandem in the National League of uh, Theo and Hoyer. Okay. Well, that, although that's a very nice thought, it is not a tandem award. Okay. It is a you can give it to Theo. You could give it to Jed. Don't well, think you're going to get both. Yeah, I don't know the inner workings of the Cubs, but I would probably say it's Theo. Okay. So he will be executive of the year, which you can certainly do. That is your prerogative as a sit in play by play yes. man for low these many games. In a very low low sit in. Well, no that's that's a good pick I mean I'm sure you can get some votes and in the American League Luna the uh, GM Jeff of Luno Houston. Yep. of Houston that's also a very good pick uh, quite obviously Houston surprised everybody and I think that Jeff Luno did a good job made some good drafts over there of course same thing could be said for the Cubs they've been terrific this year it's not going to surprise you to know that we do not agree on these two oh doesn't mean who's going to be right. Could very well be you. Is that one play the shortstop? What a Saladino, play! Saladino, did he get him? Safe. No, no chance. But Saladino covers a lot of ground. Well, he get he got to the ball, kept it out of the outfield, but kind of runs too well. I mean, this is a guy that swings the bat well, hits the ball hard, and Tyler makes a terrific play from his back knee, tries to get it across, and. Makes it a whole lot closer than it should have been, but doesn't get him. So it's first hit of the night, and now Canna one for two. For Billy Butler, a candidate for a double play ball with one out here, but he drives this to left center, and nobody's going to get this one. Billy Butler has just gone yard on a two-run homer. Billy hit that ball a mile. Yes, he did. Choose that ball. Off his bat, you knew it was gone. That's his 12th. He's now driven in 59. And it's a first pitch, two run shot. So it's a 9 to 3 game. As Butler gets a fastball, it's on the inner third. And he rides it out of the yard. Well, Johnson has thrown 104 pitches, Steve, and I think. They'd just like to see him get out of the city and then go to the pen. I think that's probably what's going to happen for the first time tonight. The pen is starting to stir. But we'll get back for the moment to executives of the year. To me, it's Alex Anthopoulos Ooh. for the Toronto Blue Jays in the American League. He's got his team 20 games over 500. It's a team that for the longest time looked like it wasn't even going to be close to the New York Yankees. 
and all of a sudden he made some dramatic moves at the trade deadline. Absolutely dramatic moves. And that's a call third strike. Speaking of Toronto, Alex traded, of course, for Donaldson and Brett Laurie, who just took a call third, was a part of that major blockbuster trade. Yes, he was, and they'll always remember that in Oakland, especially as Donaldson picks up his MVP. And in the National League, I'm going to surprise you with one. I don't know if it's going to work out, but to me, Neil Huntington. For the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Pirates, mm -hmm. only because he's had that team sitting right there all year long. Not saying they're going to catch St. Louis, or not saying they'll get by the one and done game, but they're 30 games over 500, Chuck. 30 games. He's kind of an underrated, under the radar executive. Well, if you get a chance to ever speak with him, I'm, I'm sure eventually down the road you probably will. You realize a guy that. Spent a lot of time with the Cleveland Indians, understands the front office because he came up through every aspect of the business. That's the one thing I liked about Neil Huntington was that he did everything there was to do in the front office and understood the job before he got it. Then in getting the job, he slowly built that Pittsburgh team, and they're real good right now, and that's an excellent bunt, and it's going to be a tough play. Ball gets away, but it'll go as a base hit. And Sogard lays down a perfect bunt, takes a look at Old. It's a 9 to 3 game, but if they're giving you a base hit, you might as, might well, as well take, take it. it. We've got two outs here in the 6 9 3 White Sox. So those are my two picks, long shot picks. I like Anthopoulos from Toronto and Neil Huntington from Pittsburgh. Well, having uh, worked in Toronto and doing a sports talk show in that market, we had Alex on many a time when he was working under a couple other GMs. Uh, with that organization, including J.P. Ricciardi, who was the general manager there for a few seasons. But uh, Paul Beeston, who's in a swan song with Toronto, who's an outstanding human being, first and foremost, and the president of the ball club, and a great, great man. And I'd love to see them do well in postseason, Steve, because if there's anyone who deserves it, and a lot of people deserve it, obviously, but Paul Beeston, his heart and soul has been with that city, with that country, and he's done a lot of good things for Major League Baseball. I think one of the things you'll find out if you haven't, and I'm sure you have about Beeston, is that anybody who's ever come in contact with him in any context will tell you, for the first thing he'll tell you, besides the competence and the ability to be a baseball executive, he's a terrific man. He's done a great job there. He's done a great job in the in the commissioner's office for baseball. Mm -hmm. There's a deep fly ball left field at the track. Cabrera going back and he makes the grab. So the White Sox come to the plate now in the sixth. Eric Johnson walks headed to the dugout. That could be it for him, but the White Sox in front, nine to three.
way. The 97999 right now for your chance to win six meals from the Simple Six menu from Subway. Message and data rates may apply. Subway, eat fresh. And we've got a new pitcher coming in the ball game, and it is Arnold Leon. We've seen him in this series. We've seen just about everybody in this series. <laughs> yes. And there's a look at Leon, who's 0-2, his ERA, 531, on for the 15th time. Opponents hitting a robust 325 against him. With 27 hits and 20 in the third innings. He started his professional career in the Mexican League. In Saraperos de Saltillo of the Mexican League, and that was in 2006. So Jose Abreu at the plate. He homered his 29th of the year in this ball game. Well, see, you threw me, you know, a surprise question about executive of the year. I'm going to ask you about manager of the year now. Uh, and again, we have a lot of baseball to be played. Manager folks. of the year. Mm -hmm. Leon to Abreu. Underneath it is Smolinski. And one retired here in the bottom of the sixth. Well, there's going to be a lot of sentiment because it's two years in a row now for a pretty good team. A lot of sentiment will go toward Ned Yost for Kansas City. So I think that certainly is a possibility. Can I stop you there and ask a question about him for well, a moment? Of course Steve? you can. Okay. How come he drew so much criticism? You know, last year during the playoffs and World Series, mm -hmm. I mean, he came under a lot of heat. Yeah, he did. And why is that? For the decisions he made. Now he had a very good ball club, and you know what they usually tell you, Chuck, is that nothing makes a manager look better than a great bullpen. And Kansas City had, and does have this year, a great bullpen. He's a ground ball. Butler with a flip to Leon. So this is not to diminish Ned Yost. He's going to have, as they say, he's going to have some people who are going to vote for him. The guy that I hope would win it. But I don't think will is John Gibbons only because John is in his second go round with Toronto. He's a terrific guy. I think he's one of those guys that has been very much under the radar. A lot of people don't think he can manage very well. Seems to me like he can. But I think when you look at everything, all the adversity they've gone through, the guy that I give it to, which might be somewhat surprising because other years everybody said he should win it. This year, I believe that. This is the year that he's got a great shot of winning it. That's Joe Girardi. Yes. I think with all the problems Excellent. he's had in New York, all of the injuries he's had, everything he's had to go through with that ball club, all the people that were supposed to do it and didn't, Joe has kept that team right there. They're leading tonight at Tampa Bay at the bottom of the ninth inning, 3-1. to one. And that team is still in the race despite the whole pitching staff falling apart. Going back in right field for the grab Smolinski who's played very well in that position tonight. One, two, three, quick hitting. We'll return in a moment here in Chicago. White Sox holding on for a 9 3 lead. Stick around, folks.
Here's one of the bright lights in the Sox organization. Frankie's got a very strong arm. And you look at what he's done so far, just on for the fourth time, a 180 earned run average. Total of five innings, giving up five hits. And he's fan six. So he really impressed everybody with the stuff that he had. And hopefully he can carry it over to the major leagues because he's going to be given every opportunity and he can rush it up there. Yes, he can. 6'2, 185. Started his career in the Red Sox system, came over to the White Sox, part of that three team deal involving Jake Peavy, Iglesias, who you're going to see in a week in Detroit, and of course, Garcia. 13,000 and five people tonight. And a lot of dogs. That's 26,010 legs. <laughs> it's 823 canines. That's 3,292 legs. So, yes. 823 canines on Bark at the Park night. I see where you're going with this. this and that is a that is a big dog. That should count as three dogs. Now, Steve, how many dogs do you have? I have three dogs: two Rhodesian Ridgebacks and a Greyhound. Rhodesian Ridgebacks, for those of you who might not know, it's a South African breed, and they're lion hunters. Really? Yes. And they've done a great job. In the backyard in Scottsdale, ever since we acquired them, we have not seen a lion yet. <laughs> so they have made sure that <laughs> everything is safe. Swing at the best spot, Larry, he goes down for the second time tonight. Good sharp breaking ball. This ball down in the zone just disappears. And when you've got 98, 99, and sometimes 100 in your pocket, that breaking ball looks awfully stout. And Johnson went six innings, gave up three runs on six hits, walked three, fan three. And overall, gave up a two run homer to Billy Butler, but looked pretty good again. The third straight outing, pretty impressive. He looks to be. On his way to winning his second game in his three starts. And the no decision was pretty impressive. So Fernando Abad warming up in the pen. Another guy that we saw last night, the left hander, two nights ago rather, the left hander threw pretty well. Little looper, shallow left. Saladino once again covering a lot of space out there with the grab. Again, Joe Girardi, excellent choice, manager of the year from Steve Stone. A.J. Hinch is going to get some votes. Yes, Bannister with Texas. Jeff Bannister yes, is, is going to get some I, I votes. Think, I think Jeff may be a little young to the manager at this point to get it. Uh, Joe is doing it on what the What happens if he guides the Rangers to the playoffs? You'd have to look at them. Absolutely. I, and I think he'll get some votes. I just don't think he'll get enough votes to win at all. So, taking over to the National League, I will tell you, in my estimation, it's going to be a complete New York sweep. Terry Collins mm -hmm. to win it for the Mets in the I National disagree. League. I think it's going to be Joe Madden. That's great. I mean, that's again, what, that's why. Well, that's, that's I love talking baseball, and that's the that's beauty the beauty of, of baseball is that you make an opinion, you'll make a selection, someone will have another idea, and that's a good one. Joe Madden, it's a very good pick. But if you finish third, I just don't know how you're going to beat a guy who is going to finish first, especially a guy in New York. But a whole lot of people didn't think the Mets would be there. And when you look at what happened, where everybody was conceding it to Washington, I mean, literally saying, okay, Washington, they're obviously going to win the division, then they'll worry about who they play in the playoffs, and then it'll be Washington and fill in the blank in the World Series. It's not going to be that way. It's not going to work out quite that way. So we'll see. It could very well be Joe Madden, and he would be deserving of it. I just think that. Going to be a year or so yet before Joe wins it. Well, we talked earlier about possibilities for executive there in the National League. How about what Alderson did at the trading deadline? I Terrific. mean, he shuffled the deck. Absolutely. He did a really nice job. And Cespedes is probably the key acquisition, maybe in all of the playoffs. Now, a lot of people say David Price to Toronto, but Cespedes took a more abundant New York Met offense and rejuvenated it. Simeon took a call third strike and he knew it. That'll end the uh, this half of the inning. White Sox coming to the plate up nine to three. We'll return from Chicago.
We have a new pitcher coming in the game, and it is Fernando Abad. Abad, two and two, is ERA 386 on for the 57th time. That dog with the Sox bandana having quite a night. Now, is that what they, what is that, a corgi? A corgi. corgi. Yeah. Like corgi and Bess? That's yeah. a beautiful animal. That's a corgi named Bess. A corgi named Bess. I, I, I know where you're going with that. <laughs> so, Abad, who has uh, spent time with Houston, Washington, in his uh, second season with Oakland, with uh, J.B. Shuck, who is... Uh, Playing center field tonight for the White Sox. I, I I have to get this in because you you were talking about Harper who has a legitimate shot winning the MVP in the National League over Goldschmidt and Cespedes and whatnot. You know that Harper came out last night in support of his manager Matt Williams very strongly because Matt Williams right now is feeling a ton of heat in the nation's capital. Well, I think it's it's. Good that the star players come out in support of their manager, assuming that they really feel that way. And he obviously does. He is and is going to be for some time, you would hope, the face of the franchise. Now, that is not going to affect the decision of Mike Rizzo if he feels there's another man who's better able to get the job done than Matt Williams. But we'll have to wait and see. Pit, uh, Washington has been picked a couple of years now. It hasn't worked out for them. So we'll see what Mike Rizzo, the general manager, has in mind for Matt Williams, the manager. And I'm a big fan of Rizzo. I think he's done an outstanding job there, Steve. But yeah. he's got a big decision to make in the offseason because if the Mets re-sign Cespedes with what they've got, Atlanta still probably going to be a little young going into the 2016 season. Philadelphia is still a few years away. Atlanta wants to make sure they're ready to go when they get into the new stadium. Yes, in Cobb so County. The future is going to be then as opposed to now. Chuck is one for three. White Sox busted this game wide open with six in the fourth inning. They've gone yard three times tonight. Holt along with Sanchez at a brave. Series finale tomorrow. The Hawk returns to the booth with Steve Stone. Fly ball to the left. White Sox and New Amsterdam Vodka both know what it's like to taste greatness. That taste is award winning smoothness. So when you're with your friends, lift the glass to your team, Chicago, New Amsterdam, and it's your town. New Amsterdam is the official vodka of your Chicago White Sox. There is a rather large hound certainly enjoying the evening. Beautiful night at the ballpark still 74 degrees. And a beautiful night up on a scoreboard. It's still nine to three. Sox have out hit the athletics eight to six. It's been an airless game. Eric Johnson in line to win his second game of the year started this one. Frankie Montas with a very impressive seventh inning. Boy, his stuff looked overwhelming. Coming back our way where Steve Stone once caught a foul ball here in this booth. Barry Zito picked up today, pitched in Nashville this season, and uh, spoke to Barry prior to the ball game. And he said, you know, he, he thought this was it. He thought he was done, done. And he still doesn't know about whether he's going to pitch in 2016. He is one of the most transparent individuals I've ever met, Steve. He, he is so wonderful as far as just... You know, communicating his feelings about the game and about where he's at right now in life. He said his wife influenced him to come to Oakland here. He said he was just playing toss the other night. Well, I would love to see, for the sake of baseball in the Bay Area, and a wonderful farewell for Tim Hudson, who is going to retire at the end of this year. I'd love to see if Barry Zito goes out there and pitches one inning. I'd love to see him start the game against Tim Hudson when the Giants play Oakland in Oakland the final three games and that would be terrific. Yes. 
Barry Zito, a Cy Young Award winner, and he also won a ring with the Giants. And, you know, I can't think of too many players who have played at a high level uh, that played for both the Giants and Oakland. I mean, Vida Blue did that. Oh, swing it away, off to the right, trying to chase it down, and that's a foul ball catch by the right fielder, Smolinski. And that's going to end the inning. We're going to pick up on that theme in a moment regarding the possibility of Zito and Hudson because it'd be great for the Bay Area, great for baseball as well, for what Barry Zito and, for that matter, Tim Hudson have accomplished throughout their outstanding careers. But here in Chicago, 9-3 White Sox. We go to the eighth at a moment. On the Honda game summary, it's a 9 3 game, and the White Sox batted around in the fourth inning. They sent 11 men to the plate. Eric Johnson went six innings, gave up six hits and three earned runs with three walks, three strikeouts. Start something special with a great deal on a Honda, now at your Honda dealer. Chuck Swirsky filling in for the Hawk. Always a pleasure. We appreciate you having the dial set to my 50 tonight. Joined alongside Cy Young Award winner Steve Soon. Speaking of a Cy Young Award winner, Barry Zito. As we discussed him a couple of times with Reddick at the plate. But, uh, you know, Zito is, is an interesting interview to say the least. He is not a 20 second soundbite where your typical 20 second soundbite. He speaks from the heart and he gave one of the most compelling 15 minutes with the media where he just opened up not only about his career, his where he's at with baseball. He said he just left it on the field completely. He said, you know what, I have, I, I can't look back and say I wish I would have done this. I mean, he was great, Steve. Well, the thing that a lot of people don't believe, especially the people who read Michael Lewis's Moneyball, is that the three guys that made that particular team tick, outside of Miguel Tejada, who was very good, and Eric Chavez and Jason Giambi, they were all very good. But without the three pitchers, Mulder, Zito and Hudson. Nothing really happens for that team. They didn't have a big part in the movie, certainly. They were mentioned a time or two in the book, but not near as importantly as those three guys really deserve. Because when you went to face Oakland, they had a very interesting philosophy. And it was a philosophy that the Oakland team had when they won the three World Series in a row, the philosophy that both Orioles had for many years the philosophy that most good teams have and that is I will put a better man on the mound than you have on a nightly basis and I will beat you eventually and that's the way it usually works. That's the way it was set up in Oakland. That's one of the reasons why they were able to dominate 
One of the reasons why they had one of the great closing finishes of all time with that money ball team. And those three guys were pretty close to unbeatable when it came to the real, real difficult part of the season. Now, they probably would have loved to have more success in the postseason than they had, but just looking at that pitching staff and those three pitchers, and by the way, Mark Mulder will be in the Coliseum when they finish off the season to be with Hudson and Zito. All right, he's a broadcaster now. Yes. It's going to be a great time, and they had some excellent teams, teams that couldn't quite get over the hump, but excellent nonetheless. Well, Steve, as you know, that we have new viewers every night checking out White Sox baseball. Sometimes new viewers every inning. Yeah, every inning. <laughs> and, and so we toss around Moneyball, which became a movie, of course, featuring Brad Pitt playing the role of Billy Bean, the current general manager. What is Moneyball? Well, in the movie, it was a great work of fiction. In reality, what it is really is supposedly getting the value pick at whatever position you pick in. And one of the things they talked about was seeing a lot of pitches and getting getting deep into counts and a number of things like one of the guys they talked about I believe was a guy named Brown catcher picked in the 22nd round. I think you and he had about as much success as one another except <laughs> he was drafted. But you know the one thing about that particular team that they concentrated on that Michael Lewis concentrated on was I'm not sure that Miguel Tejada was a money ball guy. He was a youngster. And I'm not sure that you could put on a computer just exactly what Tejada did, except he became an MVP. And when Sandy Alderson was there, they got Giambi at first base. And Billy then decided to take the best high school hitter in the country, and Eric Chavez, at third base. And so I guess ostensibly it's supposed to be the advent of the computerization of baseball, sabermetrics taken to another level, although it wasn't started in Oakland. And a lot of people use it now, and I absolutely believe that there's a huge place in baseball for sabermetrics and all the offshoots of what it represents in baseball. There's some very smart guys in every front office that pour over computers and get printouts and do a whole lot of things. And I'm not sure that you could run baseball as well as you're running it without the use of computers these days. But one of the things they said in the movie itself and parts of Moneyball was they didn't give enough credit to the scouts, the guys who go there on a daily basis, the guys who've seen everything. And there are the scouts there. You know, you talk about guys who've been around this game forever. Mm -hmm. They can look at a stroke of a hitter, not necessarily these major league hitters, but your free agent scouts. Look at an 18-year-old and know what he's going to look like at 22. That's invaluable. That's an enormous talent to have. Tell me the ceiling of this guy. Don't tell me what he looks like now. I know that. Oh, fires. Did they get him? And Abreu with the tag. His canna took a tumble. Well, he tagged him right on the head. Yeah. And hopefully he's okay as that throw by old pulled him well off the bag. He looks at second for a moment realizes there's no play there and then throws it across off the bag and whack. Yep right on top of the helmet. Well I'll say this for the movie and again I'm, I'm just a guy in the theater like everyone that was watching the uh, Art Howe was the manager. He was not portrayed well in the movie. And Art Howe was a wonderful man, and Art Philip was a little, un a little unhappy of... with that particular characterization. So we have one out here in the top of the eighth at a 9-3 Sox lead. Philip Butler one for three. He homered in the sixth. Well, one thing, Billy Bean is a very proactive general manager. Billy Bean is a talented general manager. I mean, he's a smart guy, and he's done a terrific job with limited funds in Oakland. There's, there's no mistaking that. He's done a terrific job there. I don't mean, you know, to denigrate his abilities as a GM. The problem he's had is winning the big prize, and he hasn't gone very far in the playoffs. Now, 
He assembled a baseball team last year, and he traded away a great deal to get in a position to play, as it turned out, a one-and-done game, and unfortunately, he was done against Kansas City, and he traded away... Cespedes, Addison Russell? Right, Addison Russell, Cespedes, and Billy McKinney. That's a lot to deal away to play in a one-and-done game, only to come up short. Butler rips a fly ball, backing up about six feet with the play made by Shuck and the runner Reddick advances to third and Reddick is a prime example of what you're talking about. He came in from the Boston system and Oakland acquired him as the Red Sox picked up a reliever. Well at the time he wasn't just any reliever at the time he was a guy that everybody thought was going to be a lights out closer by the name of Andrew Bailey and Bailey was the key in that deal that sent Reddick to Oakland. As it turned out, Andrew Bailey got hurt very early in his stint in Boston, never really accomplished what he needed to accomplish, and Reddick went on to become a pretty good player with Oakland. So we have two outs here. Reddick on at third. Well, I know it's so tantalizing when you go for it when they picked up Samarja along with Lester, but early in the uh, telecast, folks, Steve mentioned the fact that maybe instead of a one-and-done, maybe a best-of-three where you have a day-night doubleheader. Well, it doesn't have to be a day-night doubleheader. It can be anything. I like the idea of a doubleheader. At least one of the days, preferably the first day, maybe the second day. doesn't really matter. But There's Garcia at the track, making a grab. And the city is over. We go to the bottom of the eighth. Let's pick up that topic in a moment. White Sox with a 9-3 lead. Stakes now for the chance to win a variety of unique prizes, including a jersey autographed by the 2005 White Sox tickets to Fan Appreciation Day on October the 4th and more. Visit whitesox.com slash summer sweeps. We got a new pitcher coming in the ball game, and it is R.J. Alvarez. We saw R.J. last night. It's a 9-3 game. And Alvarez last night picked up an inning. And he gave up a run on a hit. A couple of walks, a couple of strikeouts. There you look at the numbers. The ERA inflated with only 17 games and only 15 in the third innings. White Sox in front, 9-3. Bottom of the eighth inning to play with Alvarez on the mound. You know, Steve, overall, and obviously it's been a disappointing season for the White Sox to say the least, but overall as far as this season's concerned for Major League Baseball, it's been some great storylines regarding players, regarding teams. It also bodes well for the future of Major League Baseball because this year, unlike most any year I can remember, there were more young players mm -hmm. 
that came into the major leagues and more very young players who had been here who started to star in the major leagues. But you know we saw more home runs hit in the month of August in Major League Baseball by rookies than ever before in the history of the game. And it shows that there's so many great young players that have come up and that are helping their teams in many instances in the middle of pennant chases. Certainly in the middle of wild card chases. You know guys in years past wouldn't have had those opportunities. They're getting them now and making the most of them. And it gets back to your point regarding scouts. Saladino by the way led off with a line out to Lori. But scouting is a thankless job. These guys are on the road. I don't care what level whether you're a cross checker whether you're scouting the minor leagues whether you're all over the map looking for the next phenom. But these people do an outstanding job and yes. You know it's unscientific you're going to make mistakes that's just the body and the nature of work but I, I give these people a lot of credit I cover the NBA and I see what John Paxson Gar Foreman and their staff do they're watching a kid in Tuscaloosa Alabama on a Tuesday they're going to practice in you know Las Vegas watching UNLV on a Thursday I mean they're all over the place and I have such great respect. I mean, how, how do you grade a scout, though, Steve? If you were a general manager, what do you? How, how do you say this guy is a great scout? Well, for me, what you have to do is you actually have to scout the scouts. Really? You, yeah, because you're looking at reports and you're going to see how each and every scout valued the guys who got to the major leagues, the guys who made it, the guys who didn't, and you're going to look at what scout has their name on certain guys, saying, "Yay on this guy, nay on this guy." And what you're doing is scouting the scouts. That's the only way you can really tell exactly just how good these guys are overall. And you hit it right on the head when he said it's not an exact science, but great scouts are worth their weight in gold because they're getting you your organization's goal. And what makes a good free agent scout doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be a good major league scout. There's a different set of criteria, there's different eyes you have to look at. For the veteran guys who are advanced scouts in the major leagues are guys who go and they're looking right now they're looking at all the free agent talent that's out there. Why do you think so many people are here for the White Sox and Oakland. It's certainly not to scout them for any kind of postseason play it's scouting the free agents. Mm, good point. And that ball is in fair territory but it was off the foot of Adam Eaton at least Adam Eaton says it was. Yeah and Robin Ventura. Wants to have a conversation here. See, by the way, you, when you came out of Kent State, the scout that that saw you and that signed you, did you ever see your own scouting report? As we take a look at the replay here, Adam is saying that bounced off his foot. Stu Sherwater is saying that it didn't, as Adam is hopping around. It's tough to tell from that angle. Let's see from yep. this. That angle is almost yeah. impossible, but Adam is the guy who had it hit off his foot. So in any event, it's going to go as as an out. I can envision what that scouting report looked like. Was here to see Thurman Munson. <laughs> yes. And saw a right-hander who might have a chance somewhere in the back of your bullpen. That's probably almost word for word what that scouting report said. But the guy who did draft me and eventually sign me was very particular in that he scouted for close to 20 years and he signed one player. Me. Wow. Yeah. I, I can't tell you that he waited around that long. I can <laughs> tell you probably they didn't listen to him except for the one guy and it turned out to be me. Sanchez. And the left fielder underneath it. Cannon. And they'll retire the side. But we go to the ninth inning. White Sox nine, Athletics three.
Clemente, Roberto Clemente Day recognizes one player from each club who best represents the game of baseball through positive contributions on and off the field. You can visit www.chevybaseball.com to learn more. Chuck Swirsky filling in for the Hawk, who returns tomorrow in the series finale. Afternoon baseball here at U.S. Cellular, joined by Cy Young Award winner Steve Stone. In a 9-3 ball game, this game was busted open in the fourth with six runs for the White Sox. And there you look at Scott Carroll, who comes in. He's 1-1, one one, his ERA a fine 341 on for the 14th time. And as Robin had to go through a good portion of the bullpen, they recalled Scott giving him another opportunity, and here he is. Give me a little idea about uh, Scott and what you've seen out of him this year. I think, Chuck, he's absolutely been invaluable in that every pit, every team needs a guy that is going to be able to eat up innings for you. And Scott's been that guy. This is a tough play. Barehanded. Did he get him? Yes. Well, that's just a great effort right there by Mike Holt and on the other end by Jose Abreu. Right down the line, Sogard runs pretty well. And Holt with the bare hand pickup, the throw in the same motion. And then the scoop on the other end. And Sogard is out by plenty. Good effort. Smolinski 0 for 3. So I'll let you get back to what you were saying about Scott Carroll. I think that every team has to have a guy that's going to eat up some innings for you in games that are tough. So you don't run through your bullpen if you happen to have a couple of starting pitchers that just don't go deep into the game. And Scott is one of those guys. He takes the ball. I've never known him to refuse the baseball. And he usually throws it pretty well, as you would expect with an ERA under three and a half. So he becomes a very valuable man on a staff. He's not going to get a lot of decisions. He is going to get some innings where you don't get a lot of acclaim, but where the pitching coach and the manager really appreciate the job you did because you saved the bullpen. And this is a home run. All the White Sox can do is watch as Walensky goes yard. Player from Rockford. I'm sure some family and friends are here to cheer him on. That's his fifth home run. He's now driven in 21, and we've seen the power he's had. He just showed you a little bit more of it right there. So it's a 9 to 4 game. Scott throws a fastball. That one inner portion and down. And Jake Smolinski unloads on it. Blair is 0 for 3 tonight. Here's Steve, I had to get a, a chuckle out of uh, your description when you were talking about being scouted. And you said the scout probably was looking at Thurman Munson and and then and, uh, all of us said, yeah, Steve Stone, do you know at your alma mater, this is a true story, Jack Lambert, who was a great player, Hall of Fame player, yeah. that uh, the Steelers were looking at another player for Kent State, the Golden Flashes. And all of a sudden they're looking, and in those days, folks, they had film, and they're looking at the film, and all of a sudden this, this linebacker, this ferocious, you know, just was devouring these running backs. And the way he was doing it, he said, who is this guy? And that's how Jack Lambert was drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Undersized middle linebacker at the time. 215 pounds of middle linebacker. Even in that day and age, that's a very small. Yeah, I think we were looking around 1972, somewhere around that, that period. They had uh, Gerald Tinker was a wide receiver. Greg Kokel was a quarterback under Don James who had a great legacy at the University of Washington. But it's funny how scouting works. You never know. Well, the White Sox hopefully will be able to hold on to this lead and go into the series finale. Yeah, the one thing Robin does not want to do is go any deeper in the bullpen than he already has. Nice outing by Frankie Montas. He's got a good arm, boy. We're taking a look each and every game. We're taking a look at parts of the future for the White Sox. A lot of impressive young players. We're going to see more of Trace Thompson. We saw Tyler Saladino at shortstop tonight. He looked pretty good. And now there's just one out to go. But this is what September is like for teams that aren't going to get there. He's taking a look at a good
good part of the future and trying to evaluate just exactly what your game plan is heading into the winter and then eventually getting to spring training. Because mm -hmm. every team has got to have a plan, an idea of what they want to do and who they want to march forward with. So Sam Full one for three. White Sox with nine runs on the board on eight hits. They have not committed an error. Three home runs on the night. Sanchez with a two run shot in the second of Rayu with a solo blast and Olt with a two run homer. And the White Sox afternoon baseball tomorrow. And if they hit the road, 11 straight on the road, including a four game series to end the road trip in New York against a Yankee ball club still trying to buy for the American League East crown. Yankee ball club that won tonight, three to one at Tampa Bay. And so Steve, the Yankees at 80 and 65. 80 and 65. Toronto won tonight on the road, beating Atlanta 9-1. Swing it a mess. Meantime, Texas. Last time they took they will lose that ball game the final now, Stephen. 14 to 3. Texas beat Houston. They've opened up a game and a half lead over the Astros. 2-2 two -two pitch coming up with two outs here in the top of the ninth. Three and two. And if Fold gets on base, that'll leave it up for Simeon. There's a young lady ready to go. She brought her glove, but she's hoping she doesn't have to use it because of the third out. Three and two, two outs. Carroll on the mound against Sam Full. Here's a chopper to first and a high hopper over the glove of Abreu. That took a bad hop. Sanchez backing up the play. That ball hit the bag, Steve? It looked like it hit the back of the bag. It also looked like it was going to be the third out. But then this happened. Watch it. As it hit in front of the bag, but then hit the bag and bounded over Jose's head. It hit the dirt. No, it did, didn't hit it at all, as a matter of fact. Just had a lot of overspin yeah. on it and kicked up over his head. That was a most unusual hop. Yes, it was. Great camera work by our terrific crew here, which we sincerely appreciate all the hard work and men and women in the truck and the cameras around U.S. Cellular bringing you some great, great pictures tonight and every night with Simeon, Simeon one for four. With full on at first. Marcus is one for four. Zach Putnam loosening just in case. Hopefully he'll be saved for tomorrow afternoon in the finale of the homestand. With the 2 2 count to Simeon. Full down at first. White Sox with a 9 4 lead. After winning Monday night in 14 8 7. Getting smacked last night, 17 6. Sox trying to take a 2 1 series lead. Here's the 2 2 pitch. That hit him. Yep. And now Robin is looking at Tom <laughs> Cooper and going, no, this is not really happening. Let's, let's see what we can do yeah. here. 
Yeah, you want to replay what happened Monday night, Stephen? He calls up Bobby Thigpen to find out if Putnam is ready. You know what I think you should. I think you should uh, Mike Coop for one game. We got to yeah, talk to Jimmy Angio. And... I'm not sure that that'll be for consumption. <laughs> As Don Cooper now comes out, he wants a word with Scott Carroll. You think they're just stolen for time here before they go to Putnam? No, Don Cooper doesn't take anybody out. He just trying to convince him exactly what they want to do with Reddick. Tell him a little bit, leave with a positive attitude. Probably tell him, look, throw a sinker on the outside corner, and he will ground it to the right side, and the game will end. Or else, if Reddick, who's 0 for 3, gets on base, then we may have a pitching change. I would think that yes, that would that would be in the cards. So here's Reddick stepping in, lined out in the first, flied out in the third, grounded out in the sixth. He walked in the eighth. The Athletics with runners at first and second with two outs. Scott Carroll trying to seal the deal here. count. Nice play and Abreu takes the stroll to the bag and that will end it. That was well hit. But Jose Abreu right there on the White Sox. Victoria Steve Stone. Ground ball to the right side. Just like you called it. And that is that. So the Sox win a ball game and they take a two to one lead in the series. So we'll step out and be back after these messages. <laughs> 